Hello, I am Raftera and my content revolves around making detailed Legends of Runeterra guides for decks that I find success with in Ranked Ladder. However, I came to the realization that in order for you guys to use these decks to their max potential, you must be equipped with some fundamental skills in LOR. Which is why in this video, I will cover 5 fundamental skills that you need in order to reach masters in Legends of Runeterra. Card Anticipation is the most basic skill in this list and it will be the foundation for the skills that follow. This is the skill of knowing or anticipating what cards your opponent runs in their deck. Card Anticipation is pretty simple. For every play that you make, you need to ask yourself the following questions. What card could your opponent play and what can you do or what will happen if your opponent plays that card? Let's look at a specific example. Let's say that you're facing Ezreal Caitlyn with your Zoe Aphelios deck. It's turn 1, your opponent open passes and has the attack token. You have a Zoe in hand that you can play, but you can anticipate that your opponent might have Thermogenic Beam to respond to your Zoe. If you play your Zoe now, you won't be able to attack with her yet. Also, if your opponent has Thermogenic Beam, you will be trading your Zoe with it, which is a 1 card for 1 card or a 1 mana for 1 mana trade. Alternatively, you can pass for now and play your Zoe on turn 2 instead when you already have the attack token. In this scenario, your opponent needs to commit a 3 mana Thermo Beam or a 2 mana Mystic Shot in order to stop the Zoe from attacking and getting value. However, if that happens, you'll already be slightly ahead because your 1 mana Zoe traded for a 2 mana or a 3 mana card. Pretty simple, right? Just ask yourself what your opponent can do on specific turns and you can make your plays based on those. Your ability to anticipate cards will improve more the more you play Legends of Runeterra because you will be more familiar with the decks and the cards that they usually have. Some examples of other cards to anticipate are Petricide Broadwing on turn 2 against Bard Demacia decks or Viego on turn 5 against Viego Shurima or Viego Noxus decks. It's one thing to be aware of what cards to anticipate from your opponent's deck and it's another thing to make assumptions on whether or not your opponent actually has that card in their hand. For example, you can always anticipate that Ezreal Caitlyn has a Mystic Shot in their deck but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will always have it in their hand. This is where the next fundamental skill will come in handy. Over. Now I hunt. Hand reading is a skill that allows you to make assumptions on what card your opponent has or doesn't have in their hand. Let's start with how to make assumptions on what card your opponent doesn't have in their hand because that one is pretty simple. You just need to watch out for situations where they could have used a specific card but they didn't. In that scenario, in the following turns, it's safe to assume that they won't have that card in their hand unless they draw it specifically. For example, if you're playing deep against a Shadow Isles control deck and you present them with a juicy juicy Nautilus on turn 7 but somehow they didn't respond with Vengeance. For the next turns, it will be a very logical assumption that they don't have Vengeance in hand unless they top deck it specifically. Next, we go on how to make assumptions on what cards your opponent has in hand. This will be a little bit more complicated because you will need to observe how your opponent is playing on specific turns. A very simple example would be if you're facing a Shadow Isles Noxus control deck and they go out of their way to ping your unit with a Go Hard or Vile Feast. This is usually a telltale sign that they're setting up for a Ravenous Flock or Scourge Earth in their hand. Another example would be a scenario where you're facing a Curve Reliant boar centric deck like Scouts or Bard Demacia and they don't play any units in the first two turns. These types of decks usually want to curve out and establish an early board. If they're not playing units in spots where they should be doing so, you can make an assumption that they might be on a spell heavy hand with Golden Ages or Relentless Pursuit. However, be mindful in scenarios where your opponent uses draw cards like Glimpse Beyond or Whispered Words. In this case, you may need to do a reset on your hand reads and use this next fundamental skill. Card counting is a fundamental skill that goes hand in hand with hand reading. Get it? Hand in hand with hand reading? Fuck. Never mind. Card counting involves making assumptions on whether or not your opponent has more copies of a card that they already played. Before we go further, I want to point out that before you do card counting, you want to do hand reading first. If you've already made the hand read that your opponent doesn't have a specific card, there's no need to card count for that card anymore. With that out of the way, there are three questions that you want to ask yourself when card counting for a specific card. 1. Has your opponent already played the card? 
2. How many copies of that card does your opponent's deck usually play? And 3. Does your opponent keep that card in their mulligan or in their opening hand? Let's look at some specific examples. Aphelios in Targon decks or Ravenous Flock in Control decks are usually always ran as a 3 off and you always keep them in your opening hand. For these cards, if your opponent already played one copy, it's reasonable to assume that they might have another copy in hand. If they already played two copies, it can be logical to assume that they don't have the third copy because the probability of that would be very low. Another good example would be Vengeance. This card is usually run as 1 to 2 copies in mid range decks or 2 to 3 copies in control decks. In the Mulligan, Vengeance is a card that you usually keep only one copy of or no copies at all depending on the matchup. Thus, if your opponent already played one copy of Vengeance, it can be logical to assume that they don't have the second one because the probability of that happening is very low. My third example would be late game cards like Ruination, Bury the Nice, and Feel the Rush, which are usually run with 1 to 2 copies. Although these cards are usually never kept in the opening hand, I always assume that opponent has at least one copy in their hand. These cards are late game cards and your opponent has a lot of time in the early to mid game to draw into them. And now it's one skill to know or anticipate what cards your opponent has in their deck. It's another skill to assume if they actually have that card in their hand. However, if they do have that card in their opening hand, it's another skill to identify on whether or not you should play around it. That last sentence I said might be a little bit confusing, so let me elaborate. Just because you can make the assumption that your opponent has a specific card in your hand doesn't mean that you should always play around that card. As a general rule, only play around the card if you have answers to it or if you can afford to play around it. Let's look at a specific example of when to play around a card. Let's say you're playing a Viego Ionia deck against a Shadow Isles control deck. It's turn 5 and you have Viego plus Deny in your hand. You can assume that your opponent is saving Vengeance for your Viego. However, because you have access to Deny, you can afford to play around Vengeance by passing this turn. If you play your Viego on turn 6 instead, you will have enough mana to protect him from Vengeance with your own Deny. Let's change the situation where you're playing a Viego Noxus deck instead of Viego Ionia deck against the Shadow Wilds control deck. In this scenario, it's the same, you can still assume that your opponent is saving Vengeance for Viego, but you don't need to play around Vengeance on turn 5. There's nothing you can do about it because Noxus doesn't give access to protection spells. You just play your Viego and hope for the best. This is usually referred to as the if they have it, they have it mentality. Let's look at a more specific example where you're playing Bard Demacia against a Trundle Timelines deck. Let's say that it's turn 7 and you have a wide board of units. At this point, it's very safe to assume that your opponent has the Buried in Ice plus It That Stairs combo in their hand. You only have two options here, either to play around Buried in Ice by open attacking and dealing damage before they cast it, or to develop a stronger board and risk getting blown out by Buried in Ice. You need to ask yourself what would happen if you do either option. Let's start with the first one. If you play around Buried in Ice by open attacking, will you win? In this specific scenario, your opponent has enough blockers and you won't inflict enough damage to win the game. If you don't finish the game this turn, your opponent will likely start stabilizing on turn 8 with Ice Pillar, level 2 Trundle, hit that stairs and you will lose anyway. Now let's look at the second scenario where you don't play around Bury the Nice and instead you develop a Silverwing Vanguard to threaten a stronger attack. The two possible outcomes are either 1. Your opponent responds with Bury the Nice in which case you lose the game on the spot. Or 2, your opponent doesn't have an answer to your whiteboard and you win on the spot. This is a scenario where if you evaluate your options correctly, you will come to the conclusion that you cannot afford to play around Barry the Nice, regardless of your assumptions that they have it in their hand. Your only way in winning this specific scenario is to not play around Barry the Nice and develop a stronger attack. In these cases, you have to play to win, you just have to hope for the best and go for the win. This example leads me to the final conclusion with this tip, which is the mentality of playing safe versus playing risky. You want to play safe only if you are ahead, if you are favored, and most importantly, if you can afford to. If you are playing from behind or if you are in an unfavored matchup, you cannot afford to play safe. You need to play to win, you need to play it risky, and you need to just hope that your opponent doesn't have an answer to your threats. Finally, we go to the final tip in this video which is the most important tip for climbing ranked ladder. All of the tips prior to this one won't matter if you're using a bad deck or a bad build. 
You can eliminate this factor by using proven metadex which you can check in stat websites like runeterra.ar or mobilitics.gg. Another easy way to find good decks for rank is to subscribe to the Raftera channel. Before I showcase any deck on my channel, I make sure that I test these decks personally for a good amount of games and that I come out with a high win rate when using them. On top of that, I make sure that the guides I create for each deck are of the highest quality, so make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss on any of my content. If you learned something or if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like, a comment, and consider becoming a member of the Raftera YouTube channel. Good luck climbing, have a nice day, bye bye